That's amazing. Wow, it's it, it's amazing, and it it sounds like you a little bit backed into this in the in the sense that you know you you had the traditional college education, you know, primary, secondary college education all the way through your PhD, and then found how unsatisfactory it was to be a teacher in that sort of boxed environment. And I love your story about how you you began to use social media that you were teaching anyway, and that sort of drew that entrepreneur person out. So I just find that really fascinating. Going back to the- Can I just um, add another point? Sure. Talk yeah, if you don't mind. Yes. No. And uh, so three years ago, yes, three years ago, I launched my very first live streaming show because I discovered my students, they want to learn more about social media marketing, which is what I teach but I only know this much. So I was asking myself, how can I break down my classroom walls so mm. students are not only learning from me, but they are learning from all those amazing practitioners like you outside who are actually mm. in the field, testing and developing theories by practicing on a daily basis. That's really what inspired me to launch my very first live streaming show because I want to interview those amazing people to come to my virtual classroom to share with the students. And I can't even tell you how much like my students have benefited from those live interviews. They told me, Dr. I am learning so much from those mm. people than my business school classes, than my any other class. And oftentimes, after the show is over, students are actually staying in touch with people like Mark Schaefer, wow. Seth Golden, I mean, all those thought leaders who have come to my show, they have become my students, learning opportunities, network opportunities, and just like inspiration, inspiration, yeah. right? And like, I benefited me so much. I wasn't thinking about, you know, quitting my job, or eventually, you know, running my own school. My intention was really simple. I wanted to be a better teacher. And to me, it's such an easier way to uh, actually just use what I have, which is social media, and uh, then actually creating a school. But that was me back then, three years ago. I never thought about resigning from my job. They said that I just wanted to be a better teacher using what I already use, using what I know. So that's kind of how I got started this on this. Yeah. And also, I actually grew up in China. I'm a first generation immigrant and I hated Chinese education. That's why I left China. I was looking at uh, the globe, I was like, where can I go that is really far away from China? I was like, the United <laughs> States, where I can actually get a scholarship. That was really uh, my incentive because the traditional Chinese education was pretty much STEM, right? Not, not so much technology back then, but we talked so much about math, engineering, and uh, it was just like, there's little room for creativity and it's highly, uh, based on exams and ranking competition, like we have lots of exams. I was a very uh, mentally damaged. I did really mm. well in all of my classes on the outside, but inside I was paralyzed. I was broken inside. Outside I was like this kid who loves everything, but inside was really broken. Here's another uh, quick uh, study I want to share before I let you ask me another question. <laughs> And uh, so it's, uh, it's actually uh, the implication of this study is really, really profound. And uh, it's a super chicken study. And it's done by a group of biologists. And so they want to study chickens and how, how many eggs they actually lay, how good they are, their reproduction. So what they did is that they separated the chickens into two different groups. So one group of chicken is like, the super chicken, they're already doing so well, they have more eggs, they, it's like super. So the other one is the average one, you know, average. Not so good, not so uh, like overall in terms of well-being, their weight and how many eggs they are producing. So two groups of chickens and they studied the chickens for six generations. And guess what happened after six generations? So the super chickens, they ended up attacking each other, killing each other, three survived. Really? And the average group, they're like thriving, they're producing <laughs> more eggs, they're wow. happier. Yes, 
So the implication is you can bring this to the corporate environment, you know, and uh, how many of you, I'm not very familiar with the corporate environment, but I'm very familiar with the education environment. I grew up in a super chicken education environment, <laughs> extremely competitive. By the end of high school, my classmates, we were lying to each other. Did you study? I didn't study. I do you know this question? I don't know this question. We're just like lying to each other. Why? Because there's only one or two Ivy League schools that I wanted to get into. And mm. our teachers are telling us, if you get into, your friend will have no spot, right? So you're very super competitive. Wow. And that really damaged me. That's why I said earlier, outside, I was doing really well, academically speaking. Inside, I was really broken. I think that is exactly what many children are going on right now. Going back to the other study I shared with you earlier, children who are attending high achieving schools inside is broken. And unfortunately, many parents, they don't see the root of the problem. They give their children medication. And uh, but medications are only dealing with the behavioral manifestation of a much deeper issue. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, anyway, yeah, I just want to add those two points. That's really interesting. So um, I can see based on your analogy between the super chickens and the, and the education system, why it got so competitive and why they beat up, why the chickens beat up each other and, and that kind of thing. But what was it about the average chickens that caused them to survive, thrive? Was it because, partly because they were, had never been taught to, to compete in those same kinds of ways and they were not sort of taught to become super chickens? Oh, that's a great question because they are a lot more collaborative. They collaborate with each other mm. and because they see them as a team, they collaborate as opposed to there's only either me or you, right? The super group is like either or situation, but the collaborative one is like, we're working on this like together as a team, we're collaborating and they don't see each other as a competition. And also you have that safe environment, right? I don't know if you have friends who are just like, I, like very like overachiever, they're so good at everything. You just feel stressed when you yeah. hang out with those people, right? That's right. So you, have, That's you feel true. stressed. Yeah. But if you have friends who are just, oh, you know, no big deal. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not good at this. It's just like more average. You feel a lot more relaxed. Right. You're more likely to be who you are. You're maybe more likely to succeed in whatever you do as a team, right? And you, you can see the difference. And uh, see, so imagine you have a group of those amazing friends in your network. Yes, can be very, extremely stressful, right? Yeah. yeah. That uh, really is interesting. <clears throat> yeah, going back to the um, the practical nature of learning the the digital environment. I when I was teaching at the University of Virginia and teaching these these uh, undergraduate interns at the University of Virginia Women's Center, I often would tell them this was going back three or four years that the re the reason that I was teaching them social media marketing skills was for exactly the same reason that you're teaching them social media marketing skills. So I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. thrilled to find another advocate of these things. But what I would say is that as a business owner, if I were in a hiring position and I had a candidate sitting in front of me, maybe not literally, but I had a candidate sitting in front of me who had all the things, you know, the GPA and the extracurriculars, and like you were saying, could play piano like crazy. Um, and, but really was just really good at texting with one thumb. And that was about as far as their, their uh, digital learning had taken them. And I was looking at one of my students who we actually taught them how to manage social media marketing and then gave them the platforms to work on. I think. I don't know that there was another unit at the university that would actually turn their, their own platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, and all of them over to the students. Of course, they did it with guidance. We had, we had guide, guidelines and rules. But I said that I used to say that when a student would be sitting in front of me with those skills, and especially if she could show me projects that she had done, that she had built a website, that she had uh, started a live stream of some kind, that she was on several platforms, that her brand was consistent across all platforms. 
there is, I said there was no, there would be no comparison between you and this other person who you are otherwise parallel with because I can bring you right into my organization from the shipping platform to the C-suite and have you apply those skills today because it's not just being able to be on Twitter and that kind of thing, that's super practical, but it's the other things you were talking about, the softer skills about being able to communicate. And I, at that time, hadn't thought about the collaboration and being on the teams and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, this is thrilling. I, I, I really see where you, how you've uh, lit that up. So let's talk a little bit about the, the types of projects that you have your students work on. Yeah, we do all sorts of projects. You know, I, you know, we mentioned earlier that I am an advocate of project-based learning. And when we are doing project, we need to understand the student's interest, right? It's not like I love this project, so let's work on this. But really, we listen to the students. So in academia, we call this the pedagogy of listening, right? So I think many teachers they practice the pedagogy of talking, 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 <laughs> talking, nonstop, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to do more as parents, uh, education leaders, and teachers is the pedagogy of listening, really listen to the children and design projects based on their interests. So for that's how I even homeschool my own children. We design like different projects and every day there's a theme. They work on that specific project that day. And as they are working on that project, they're developing all those skills. We can check so many boxes. So at my school uh, for this uh, Classroom Without Wars project, and so under new media, we work with the students. They will be using like basic, uh, some basic tools such as Canva to design like graphics, to, uh, to produce their LinkedIn profile picture or banner background or Twitter and uh, a poster. And they also use Adobe Spark, which I personally love. It's a very good collaborative tool to do storytelling, collaborative storytelling. It's like a Google Doc, but it's almost like it's a, a Google Doc plus website. So imagine yeah. multiple people working on the same web page wow. at the same time. So that is pretty much what is Adobe Spark. So we have students from different countries and work on the same story, collaborative storytelling, because students, so much research has shown students do not know how to communicate and collaborate. And also partially due to right now, like there are so many online classes, the only thing students need to do is to watch pre-recorded video. Uh, and I'm not saying that is yeah. not good, but if that is the only thing, only thing. Right. that the children are doing, those children, they are not learning effectively and even worse, they are not developing important 21st century skills such as communication and collaboration. Why? Because the only thing they need to collaborate with is my schedule, right? So everything is <laughs> self-paced, everything's on their demand, everything's on their terms. There's no need to collaborate with another person. That's why I love a more hybrid approach. I think that is the future. You do flipped classroom, right? There's no need for everyone sitting in front of Zoom watching the same video, right? right. Also, some people want to pause, some people want to like go back. So you can ask students to watch those pre-recorded videos, but then also there has to be that social component, which I talk a lot about this 70-20-10 model. Only 10% of a student transformation comes from formal learning, taking a class, reading a book, watching a video, that is only 10%. And 20% is the social atmosphere. Have a discussion with the peer, right? And uh, I, can you explain to me what is actually going on? And the 70% is project, experiential learning, mm. learning through real life challenges, real life projects. And so, yeah, so kind of going back to that is, this is the model that we follow. So we teach students Adobe Spark, uh, Canva, and different tools. 
and like some of the basic, you know, Trello, Asana, so they can do more collaboration. And uh, some of the specific deliverables is students will create a few Adobe Spark pages, and each of them is launching a live streaming podcast from the beginning to the end, designing their own graphic, doing the promotion, you know, learn, like research those people to practice digital networking, talking to strangers, sending people email, doing follow up, sending calendar in live, so kind of all in one package. So, and also work on their LinkedIn profile, which many students don't even know there is actually LinkedIn. I really work with them to understand how to do digital networking. And so that is one kind of under digital literacy. So under life skills, a uh, way my students are actually, I for different cohort, I collaborate with people from different countries. So the last cohort, we had students and uh, teachers from Singapore. So they came in, they collaborated with my students and each of them had to learn to adapt and we even had to change our class meeting time because Singapore was like, how many hours? 14 hours or so yeah. ahead of us. So that was a big shocker to many of my students. Like, oh yeah, there's time zone. They probably had to look at the map <laughs> where <laughs> is Singapore, right? So yeah. it's just like so many aha moments. And uh, you can also see like clashes of civilization, right? students from the east students from the west how they are working with each other collaborating so we ended uh, up with a live streaming session so students from singapore and my students they actually did a live streaming show together to present their ideas and we had a global audience to interact with our students including wow. students teachers and practitioners in my network and uh, it was such an incredible classroom experience. So this year, uh, my friends and I, we are actually organizing a global classroom, a 24 hour global classroom. We have students from Singapore, from Korea, from Brazil, from Pakistan, from the US, from the UK, from Australia. Last year, 34 countries joined. We had thousands of students talking about using social media for good. So yeah. we designed this online 24 hour classroom where students, for example, from Pakistan is having a live streaming chat with students from the United States. So we have classrooms and sessions of people from different countries working together. To me, that is the best way to cultivate those important life skills as opposed to what is the definition of emotional intelligence, right? <laughs> we can all memorize that, but can you actually practice this? I mean, like even for me, I can talk about this so well, but when I'm actually in a very stressful environment with my children, and then you really, okay, how do I apply emotional intelligence in this situation? <laughs> Application is the best learning. So I can really see big aha moments on our students' faces as they in put, as I put them into this type of uncomfortable and challenging situation. So that's how we do, that's another example of how we are doing the life skill.